Welcome to the lecture on Deleuze and Guattari's Capitalism and Schizophrenia. This lecture was researched, written, and produced by Andrew Chapman. An extensive handout that accompanies this lecture is available for download via the link in the video description. It's recommended that you download the handout and follow along as you listen to the lecture. Let's begin. Introduction Gilles Deleuze and Fay Leek Guattari's seminal work, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, comprising the volumes Anti Oedipus, 1972, and A Thousand Plateaus, 1980, is a profound and multifaceted examination of the interrelations between desire, society, and the individual under the conditions of capitalist modernity. This work is deeply embedded in the historical context of post 1968 France a period marked by widespread student and worker uprisings that profoundly challenged the structures of authority, capitalism, and cultural norms. These events, reflecting a general atmosphere of political and social upheaval across the globe, from the Vietnam War to various decolonization movements, left an indelible mark on intellectual thought, particularly in the fields of political philosophy, psychoanalysis, and semiotics. Deleuze and Guattari's text is a response not only to the political climate of the time, but also to the dominant intellectual trends. They engage in a critical dialogue with the psychoanalytic tradition, particularly the Freudian and Lacanian paradigms which posited a fundamental lack at the heart of human desire. Instead, they propose a radical reconceptualization of desire as a positive, productive force inherently linked to the social and economic structures of capitalism. This critique is set against the broader backdrop of Marxist theory and structuralism, both of which they seek to synthesize and surpass, contributing to a burgeoning post-structuralist movement that included contemporaries like Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and Jean-Francois Lyotard. The structure of capitalism and schizophrenia itself reflects the innovative and non-linear thinking that Deleuze and Guattari advocate. Anti-Oedipus introduces the concept of desiring production, a critique and reworking of both capitalist economic processes and psychoanalytic theory. It portrays capitalism as a schizophrenic entity, constantly disrupting and reorganizing social and psychic structures. A Thousand Plateaus, on the other hand, is composed of a series of independent yet interconnected essays or plateaus, each exploring different concepts like rhizomes, nomadology, and body without organs. This volume is characterized by its open-ended, non-linear approach, which allows for a multiplicity of entry points and pathways through the text, mirroring the rhizomatic networks it describes. The style and methodology of Deleuze and Guattari's work are as crucial as the content. They employ an interdisciplinary approach, weaving together insights from philosophy, psychoanalysis, political theory, anthropology, and literature, among other fields. This results in a rich tapestry of ideas that challenges conventional academic boundaries and methodologies. Their writing is dense, elusive, and often poetic, demanding active engagement and interpretation from the reader. By breaking down traditional hierarchies and embracing a more fluid, decentralized view of knowledge, Capitalism and schizophrenia, itself, becomes a model for the kind of radical, liberatory thinking it advocates. In sum, Capitalism and Schizophrenia is a complex and challenging work that defies easy categorization or summary. It offers a critical reflection on modern society, an innovative theoretical framework for understanding desire and power, and a visionary approach to philosophical and political thought. For those new to Deleuze and Guattari, engaging with this text requires patience and openness to new ways of thinking about the world, the self, and the myriad connections between them. Desiring Machines In Capitalism and Schizophrenia, particularly in the first volume, Anti-Oedipus, Gilles Deleuze and Fay Leek Guattari introduce the concept of desiring machines as a cornerstone of their philosophical inquiry into the nature of desire, production and social order. This concept represents a radical departure from the traditional psychoanalytic interpretations of desire as a lack or absence rooted in the Freudian view. Instead, 
Deleuze and Guattari envision desire as a positive, productive force that operates through what they term desiring machines. Desiring machines are essentially the unconscious mechanisms that produce and direct the flow of desire across the social and material world. They are not just metaphorical or symbolic, they are real, tangible networks of machines, with every machine being a connection of an organ machine to a source machine. The entire world is a network of such interconnected machines, continuously engaging and producing. This concept is central to their project of schizoanalysis, which seeks to overturn the repressive structures of psychoanalysis by reimagining the unconscious as a factory of production, not a theater of repression. The introduction of desiring machines allows Deleuze and Guattari to critique the way capitalist society channels, regulates, and exploits desire. They argue that capitalism operates as a kind of hyper-efficient desiring machine, capturing and codifying desire to perpetuate its own mechanisms of production and control. It deterritorializes desire from traditional social and familial bonds, only to re-territorialize it onto the production and consumption imperatives of the market. This constant modulation of desire is what keeps the capitalist machine running, and it's also what perpetuates the societal norms and power structures inherent in the capitalist system. However, desiring machines also embody the potential for revolutionary change. Because they are inherently productive and creative, they hold the potential for lines of flight, or escapes from the dominant social codes and restrictions. By understanding and tapping into the workings of desiring machines, individuals and groups can potentially redirect or reconfigure their desires in ways that challenge or elude the control of the capitalist machinery. In the broader context of capitalism and schizophrenia, desiring machines are a crucial concept that underpin many of the subsequent ideas and arguments Deleuze and Guattari present. They set the stage for a profound rethinking of not only psychological and philosophical concepts of desire, but also the very structure of society and the potential for liberation from repressive systems. The notion of desiring machines demands a radical reimagining of our world as a complex, interconnected series of productions, flows and interruptions, offering a powerful lens through which to critique and transform the capitalist reality. Schizoanalysis Schizoanalysis emerges as a response and challenge to the dominant Freudian psychoanalysis and its emphasis on the Oedipus complex, lack and neurosis. It is an attempt to understand the machinations of desire and the unconscious more affirmatively and productively. Where traditional psychoanalysis focuses on repressed desires, neuroses, and the structured theater of the mind, Schizoanalysis sees the unconscious as a factory or workshop of production, an ever-active and positive force of creation and connection. In schizoanalysis, the focus shifts from the neurotic repression of desires to the schizophrenic process of production. This does not mean glorifying the clinical condition of schizophrenia, but rather adopting its metaphorical implication as a process of deterritorialization and unbounded creation. Schizophrenia, in this sense, represents a breaking down of the signifying chains and structures that bind individuals to rigid identities and systems. It is about viewing the unconscious as an active center of production of desires and concepts, not as a dark cellar of repressed wishes and neurotic symptoms. Schizoanalysis proposes a more fluid, dynamic understanding of individual and collective subjectivity. It rejects the idea of a unified, stable identity, suggesting instead that identity is always in flux, always becoming, never fully completed or self-same. This vision is inherently political, as it stands against the rigid, hierarchical structures of society and the psychological frameworks that support them. It's an invitation to constantly challenge and renegotiate the boundaries of the self, the social, and the possible. Furthermore, Schizoanalysis is deeply connected to the critique of capitalism. It posits that capitalism, with its relentless drive for production and accumulation, captures and overcodes the flows of desire, channeling them into normalized, commodified circuits. However, just as capitalism deterritorializes, so too does desire have the potential to escape, 
to create lines of flight that elude control and open up new spaces of possibility. Schizoanalysis, therefore, is not only a tool for understanding the psyche, but also for engaging with and resisting the capitalist reality. In practice, schizoanalysis involves mapping the complex flows of desire, power and production that constitute individual and collective life. It encourages an open, experimental approach to analysis, one that is attuned to the multiplicities and intensities of desire, rather than to reductive interpretations or normative judgments. By embracing the schizoanalytic perspective, one can begin to perceive and engage with the world in more nuanced, liberated and creative ways, constantly seeking to dismantle and reconfigure the machines of domination and conformity. Deterritorialization and Re-Territorialization Deterritorialization and re-territorialization are pivotal concepts within the philosophical project of Deleuze and Guattari, particularly articulated in their collaborative works Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus. These ideas are central to understanding the dynamic flows of desire, power, and social formation, as well as the mechanisms of control and resistance within capitalism. Deterritorialization refers to the process by which entities, whether they are ideas, identities, values, or even physical bodies, are moved out of their usual context or territory. This movement isn't merely geographical. It's a metaphorical unmooring or decontextualizing of something from its usual or traditional associations, meanings, or functions. In the realm of social theory, Deterritorialization might refer to the way cultural symbols or practices are dislodged from their traditional contexts and reinterpreted or repurposed in new ones. In psychoanalysis, it might refer to the way desires or drives escape the repressive structures that seek to bind and define them. Deterritorialization is inherently a process of becoming, of change, and of potential liberation. It is the line of flight from the rigid structures that seek to territorialize or codify the flows of desire and life. This concept is particularly significant in the analysis of capitalism, which Deleuze and Guattari see as a profoundly deterritorializing force. Capitalism continually uproots individuals, objects, and signs from their traditional contexts, reconfiguring them within the expansive fluid networks of global production and exchange. However, deterritorialization is never the final state of affairs, it is invariably followed by re-territorialization. This complementary process refers to the way deterritorialized elements are reabsorbed into structured or coded systems. In other words, it's how the flows of desire, once freed from one system of control, are captured and overcoded by another system. Reterritorialization is the reassignment of a new meaning, purpose, or identity to the deterritorialized elements, often as a means of control or normalization. In the context of capitalism, while the system deterritorializes traditional social bonds, labor forms, and cultural practices, it simultaneously reterritorializes them into the capitalist economy. It captures the liberated flows of desire and channels them into consumerism, commodification, and new forms of subjugation. This incessant interplay between deterritorialization and reterritorialization is what makes capitalism such a dynamic, unstable, and pervasive force. The interaction between deterritorialization and reterritorialization is a continuous, dynamic process. It's not merely a cycle but an intricate dance of forces, constantly shaping and reshaping the socio-cultural and psychic landscapes. This dance is at the heart of Deleuze and Guattari's understanding of the world as a complex, interconnected series of machines, flows, and lines of flight. It's crucial to their method of schizoanalysis, which seeks to map these flows and lines to understand how desire moves and mutates within the social field. Understanding deterritorialization and reterritorialization is essential for engaging with the world in a critical, creative, and liberated manner. It provides a lens through which to examine the forces that shape our lives and the potential spaces of resistance and transformation. By recognizing the ever-present possibility of re-territorialization, one can strive to keep the lines of flight open, 
to resist the overcoating forces of control and to continue the process of becoming change and liberation that lies at the heart of Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical project. Rhizome The rhizome, as a concept introduced by Deleuze and Guattari, fundamentally challenges traditional hierarchical or arborescent models of thought and organization. It is inspired by the botanical rhizome, an underground stem that grows horizontally, sending out roots and shoots in various directions. This botanical behavior is emblematic of a mode of growth and connection that is non-linear, non-hierarchical, and unpredictable. As a metaphor for knowledge, culture, and social organization, the rhizome represents a vast, interconnecting network where any point can potentially connect to any other, without a central or dominant node. In a rhizomatic system, there are no singular points of origin or terminal points, instead there are plateaus, regions of intensity that are self-sufficient but also connected to the wider network. These plateaus can form connections or break off and reconnect elsewhere, reflecting the fluid, dynamic nature of thought and society. This is in stark contrast to tree-like structures that imply a rigid, binary progression from root to branches. Where trees are vertical, centralizing and dichotomous, rhizomes are horizontal, distributed and multiplicitous. This model has profound implications for how we understand relationships, systems and structures. In traditional hierarchies, elements are ranked in a linear order from top to bottom, with each level subordinated to the one above it. In a rhizomatic structure, however, every element has the potential to affect or be affected by any other, without the mediation of a higher or lower order. This leads to a more democratic, egalitarian understanding of systems, whether they are ecological, social, cultural, or psychological. The rhizomatic model is particularly relevant in the context of modern, interconnected societies, where traditional boundaries and classifications are continually being challenged and redefined. It resonates with contemporary understandings of the internet and global culture, which are characterized by non-linear connectivity, networked communication, and cultural hybridity. In such an environment, the rhizome provides a valuable framework for understanding the complex interwoven fabric of modern life, where identities, influences, and ideas intersect and interact in unpredictable ways. Moreover, the rhizomatic perspective is inherently political. By challenging hierarchical structures and promoting a model of open, horizontal connectivity, it advocates for a more flexible, inclusive approach to power and organization. It aligns with movements that resist centralized authority and rigid categorization, supporting a vision of society that is more adaptable, diverse, and resilient. In the realm of capitalism and schizophrenia, it offers a way of thinking that not only critiques the repressive, overcoating structures of capitalism, but also imagines new possibilities for creativity, liberation, and resistance. In sum, the rhizome stands as a radical alternative to traditional ways of seeing and organizing the world. It offers a vision of reality as a complex, interconnected web of relations, where diversity and fluidity are not just acknowledged but celebrated. As a metaphor and methodology, it provides a powerful tool for analysis and a source of inspiration for those seeking to understand and transform the world in more equitable, dynamic, and creative ways. By embracing the rhizomatic perspective, individuals and societies can open up new spaces for growth, connection and change, moving beyond the limitations of binary thinking and hierarchical control. Body Without Organs BWO The concept of the body without organs BWO, is another fundamental element in Deleuze and Guattari's Capitalism and Schizophrenia, particularly in the volumes Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus. It represents a radical approach to understanding the human body, desire, and the construction of subjectivity, distinct from the traditional psychoanalytic and structuralist interpretations. The body without organs is not a literal description, but a complex metaphor or a plane of consistency where the organization, hierarchy, and teleological function of the organs are suspended. It's an assemblage or a way of being that opposes the organization of the organism, which is usually structured, 
hierarchical, and defined by the functions of its constituent parts. In contrast, the BWO is characterized by its intensive non-organizational state. It is not without organs in a literal sense, but without the organization and regulatory function that typically define bodily organs. This concept is deeply tied to Deleuze and Guattari's treatment of desire. They contend that desire is a positive, productive force intrinsic to the body's functioning. The BWO is the field upon which various flows of desire are inscribed. It is a surface where intensities pass, a locus of multiple potentials. It signifies a body unmarked by social or psychological restraints, a body that is open to limitless connections and becoming. However, creating a BWO is not without its dangers or challenges. Deleuze and Guattari warn against the destructive potential of decoupling desire from its productive interplay with reality. A body without organs that is too fully realized risks becoming catatonic or empty, a body immobilized by the very lack of organization and connection it sought to escape. The key is to find the balance between deorganizing the body to escape structural constraints and reorganizing it enough to engage with the world in innovative and productive ways. In the broader context of their work, the body without organs is a way of resisting and escaping the stratifications and organizations imposed by society, language, and psychoanalysis. It is a strategy for deterritorialization, for releasing the body and desire from the normative structures that bind and restrict them. By conceptualizing the body as a field of potential, Deleuze and Guattari open up new ways of thinking about identity, subjectivity, and the production of reality. The BWO is not an end goal, but a process, an ongoing experiment in living and being. It's about continuously challenging and redefining the limits of what a body can do, how it can connect, and what it can become. In this way, the body without organs embodies the spirit of Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical project. It is an invitation to experiment, to engage with the world in more fluid, open, and creative ways. In Capitalism and Schizophrenia, the body without organs offers a powerful counter-narrative to the repressive and regulatory mechanisms of capitalism and traditional social structures. It represents a space of resistance and liberation, a way of experiencing the world that is not defined by predefined roles, structures, or identities. By embracing the concept of the BWO, individuals and societies can work towards more liberated forms of existence, characterized by diversity, multiplicity, and the constant reworking of desires and potentials. Critique of the Oedipal Complex and Psychoanalysis Deleuze and Guattari's critique of the Oedipal Complex and Psychoanalysis more broadly is a central and provocative aspect of their work, especially in Anti-Oedipus, the first volume of Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Their critique is not just a disagreement with certain psychoanalytic theories, but a fundamental challenge to the way psychoanalysis conceptualizes desire, subjectivity, and social organization. The Oedipal complex, as formulated by Freud, is a psychoanalytic theory that suggests a child's unconscious desire for their opposite-sex parent and jealousy toward their same-sex parent. This is a critical phase in the development of the individual's subjectivity and their integration into the social order. Freud considered this complex universal and foundational to the development of neuroses and the human psyche structure. Deleuze and Guattari, however, vehemently oppose this notion. They argue that the Oedipal complex is not a natural or inevitable feature of human psychology, but a production of the psychoanalytic framework that imposes a restrictive, familial model of desire onto the broader social and political field. They see the Oedipal narrative as a tool of social control, a way of channeling and normalizing desire into acceptable forms that sustain the patriarchal, capitalist order. Their critique extends beyond the Oedipal complex to the broader psychoanalytic emphasis on lack, repression, and neurosis as the defining features of human desire and experience. Traditional psychoanalysis, in their view, reduces the complex productive flows of desire to a narrow, negative framework focused on lack, the desire for what is not possessed, and resolution, 
the sublimation or repression of these desires. This model serves to uphold the status quo by aligning individual desires with the demands and structures of family, society, and capitalism. In place of the Oedipal model, Deleuze and Guattari propose a theory of desire as a positive productive force that operates through desiring machines and flows across the body without organs. They envision a psychoanalysis that is not fixated on lack and resolution, but focused on the potentials and productions of desire, a schizoanalysis that seeks to liberate desire from the repressive codes and structures that bind it. Their critique has significant implications for understanding subjectivity, society, and the possibilities for resistance and change. By rejecting the Oedipal narrative and the psychoanalytic focus on lack, Deleuze and Guattari open up new ways of thinking about how individuals relate to themselves, each other, and the social order. They envision a world where desire is not something to be tamed or cured, but a source of creativity, connection, and revolutionary potential. In essence, Deleuze and Guattari's critique of the Oedipal complex in psychoanalysis is a radical call to rethink the foundations of psychological theory and social organization. It's an invitation to envision new forms of subjectivity in society, grounded in the affirmative powers of desire rather than the repressive narratives of lack and Oedipal conflict. By challenging the psychoanalytic status quo, they pave the way for a more open, fluid, and liberated approach to understanding and engaging with the world. Anti-production Anti-production is a critical concept in Deleuze and Guattari's critique of capitalism and psychoanalysis, particularly discussed in Anti-Oedipus, the first volume, of Capitalism and Schizophrenia. This concept is intertwined with their analysis of how societies and individuals manage desire and its relationship to social production. In traditional Marxist theory, production is the creation of goods and services, driven by human labor and for the purpose of exchange or consumption. It's a fundamental aspect of economic systems, particularly capitalism, which is characterized by relentless production and accumulation. However, Deleuze and Guattari introduce the notion of anti-production to this economic discourse, an idea that complicates and deepens the understanding of how production operates within society. Anti-production doesn't refer to a lack of production or its opposite, but is instead an integral part of the production process itself. It's the necessary counterpoint that ensures the continuous movement and transformation of the system. Anti-production is what disrupts, interrupts, or redirects the flow of production, not to halt it but to regenerate and renew it. It's the expenditure, waste, or loss that accompanies every productive process, the part that escapes regulation and coding, or the excess that is not directly useful for the system, but is essential for its dynamic continuity. In a capitalist system, anti-production is tightly regulated and re-channeled as part of the larger machinery of production and accumulation. It's seen in phenomena like planned obsolescence, market speculation, or the creation of luxury goods and spectacles. These are not directly productive in the traditional sense, but serve to stimulate desires, manage surplus, and maintain the flow of capital. However, Deleuze and Guattari are particularly interested in the subversive potential of anti-production, the ways it can escape or resist the capitalist machinery and open up spaces for alternative forms of life and desire. In the psychoanalytic realm, anti-production is linked to the way the unconscious operates. The unconscious is not merely a theater of repressed desires, but an active center of production and anti-production. It produces desires, dreams, and symptoms, but it also disrupts and eludes the conscious, organized self. This disruptive aspect of the unconscious is what traditional psychoanalysis seeks to tame or resolve, but for Deleuze and Guattari, it's a source of creativity and liberation. The concept of anti-production challenges the binary opposition between production and non-production, revealing the complexity and dynamism of social and psychological processes. It suggests that disruption, excess, and waste are not merely negative or external to the system, but are integral to its functioning and evolution. By highlighting the role of anti-production, 
Deleuze and Guattari offer a more nuanced understanding of capitalism in psychoanalysis, one that recognizes the inherent instability and potential for change within these systems. In essence, anti-production is a vital concept for understanding the contradictions and possibilities of modern societies. It sheds light on the complex interplay between order and disorder, control and excess, stability and change. By embracing the potential of anti-production, individuals and societies can challenge the repressive structures of capitalism and psychoanalysis, opening up new possibilities for creativity, resistance, and transformation. Lines of Flight Lines of Flight is a compelling concept in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy, particularly resonant in their Capitalism and Schizophrenia project. It represents a key aspect of their critique and analysis of social, psychological, and political structures. The term embodies the potential for change, escape, and transformation within these systems. A line of flight is essentially a path of deterritorialization. It's an escape from the codes, norms, and structures that constrain and define individuals and collectives. Rather than being merely an act of evasion or withdrawal, a line of flight is productive. It's a creative movement that generates new ways of being, thinking, and relating. It's about breaking free from the imposed scripts and structures to create something new, be it in thought, social organization, or personal identity. In the context of Deleuze and Guattari's work, lines of flight are vital for understanding the dynamics of systems, whether those are social systems like capitalism or psychological systems like the formation of the self. Systems, in their view, are not static or monolithic, but are characterized by constant movement and change. While they tend to re-territorialize, to capture and codify flows and energies, there are always points of escape, cracks and fissures that allow for the possibility of something different. These points of escape are the lines of flight. Lines of flight are not without risk. They can lead to new formations that are as oppressive as those they escaped from, or they can lead to disintegration and chaos. But they also hold the potential for liberation and innovation. They are the roots through which new social arrangements, new forms of life, and new ways of thinking can emerge. As such, they are inherently political, tied to the possibilities of resistance and revolution. In a capitalist society, lines of flight might manifest as new cultural movements, alternative lifestyles, or innovative economic models that challenge the status quo. In the realm of psychoanalysis, they represent the moments when the unconscious breaks free from the repressive structures of the conscious mind, leading to new insights or creative expressions. In every domain, lines of flight represent the unpredictable, the unforeseen, and the potential for transformation. Understanding and navigating lines of flight is a complex task. It requires an openness to the new and the unknown a willingness to experiment and take risks. It also requires an awareness of the forces that seek to capture and re-territorialize these lines, to bring them back under control. For Deleuze and Guattari, engaging with lines of flight is an essential part of the struggle for freedom and creativity in a world marked by oppressive structures and rigid codes. In sum, lines of flight are a crucial concept in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical and political project. They offer a way of understanding the complexities and contradictions of systems, the potential for change within them, and the risks and possibilities that accompany any movement of escape or transformation. By tracing and creating lines of flight, individuals and societies can navigate the turbulent flows of modern life, seeking out new possibilities for liberation, creativity, and change. Nomadology Nomadology is a significant concept in Deleuze and Guattari's work, primarily discussed in A Thousand Plateaus. It represents their exploration of nomadic existence as an alternative to the sedentary life and hierarchical organization of the state. This idea is not just a historical or anthropological inquiry into the lives of nomadic peoples, it's a philosophical and political metaphor for resistance against centralized power and for the affirmation of a more fluid, dynamic mode of existence. At the heart of nomadology is the distinction between the nomadic and the sedentary. Sedentary life is characterized by stability, permanence, and the organization of life around fixed points, 
such as the home, the town, or the state. It's associated with the establishment of hierarchies, boundaries, and the centralized state. In contrast, nomadic life is characterized by movement, fluidity, and the constant shifting of connections and allegiances. Nomads organize their lives not around fixed points, but around routes and territories that they traverse. They are defined not by the boundaries they maintain, but by the spaces they navigate and the connections they make. Deleuze and Guattari use this distinction to critique the state and its tendency to codify, regulate, and control. The state is seen as the ultimate expression of sedentary life, imposing rigid structures, boundaries, and hierarchies onto the fluid complexities of life. Nomadology, then, is a call to resist this imposition, to find ways of living, thinking, and organizing that are more flexible, open, and dynamic. It's an affirmation of the war machine, a concept Deleuze and Guattari use not in a militaristic sense, but as a metaphor for any organization or movement that exists outside of and resists the state apparatus. However, nomadology is not just a celebration of movement for its own sake. Deleuze and Guattari are careful to distinguish between the nomad and the migrant. The migrant moves from one point to another, often forced by external circumstances, but the movement of the nomad is more like a smooth space, a trajectory that doesn't aim to settle or recapture an origin but to continue a line of flight, a creative evolution. In the context of their broader philosophical project, nomadology is a way of thinking about space, movement, and identity that challenges the dominant narratives of Western thought. It's a critique of the overcoding forces of capitalism and the state, which seek to capture and regulate the flows of desire, labor, and life. By embracing a nomadic perspective, individuals and societies can open up new spaces of freedom and creativity, resisting the sedentary logic of the state and the market. Nomadology, therefore, is not just a historical or cultural concept, it's a deeply political and philosophical one. It represents a way of engaging with the world that values diversity, fluidity, and continuous transformation. It's about creating and inhabiting spaces that are open, interconnected, and in constant flux, rather than closed, isolated, and static. In this sense, nomadology is a vital aspect of Deleuze and Guattari's vision for a more liberated, creative, and dynamic mode of existence. It's an invitation to rethink our ways of living, moving, and being in the world, challenging the structures that confine and define us, and exploring new territories of possibility and change. Assemblage Assemblage is a pivotal concept in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical lexicon, particularly resonating throughout A Thousand Plateaus. It offers a way to understand the complex, multifaceted connections that constitute entities, whether they are social, biological, linguistic, or otherwise. An assemblage, in the broadest sense, is a collection or gathering of heterogeneous components that come together to function as a whole, yet maintain their individuality. The strength of the assemblage concept lies in its flexibility and applicability to a wide range of phenomena. It doesn't just apply to physical gatherings of objects or people, it extends to ideas, relationships, machines, animals, and more. Assemblages are not static, they are dynamic and fluid, constantly shifting and changing as elements come and go, as connections are made and broken. This makes the concept particularly useful for analyzing the complex, interconnected nature of modern life. In an assemblage, each component retains its distinctiveness. They don't meld into a uniform whole, but instead function together in their uniqueness. This aspect emphasizes the idea of multiplicity and diversity within unity. An assemblage is defined by the arrangement and interaction of its parts, not by any inherent essence or identity. It's the relationships between the parts, the way they interact, affect each other, and function together, that give an assemblage its character and capabilities. Deleuze and Guattari differentiate between two types of assemblage, machinic assemblages of bodies, actions, and passions, and collective assemblages of enunciation, of acts and statements. The former relates more to the material or physical world, while the latter pertains to the realm of language, communication, and expression. Both are integral to understanding how entities come together, operate, and express themselves. 
The concept of assemblage is inherently political for Deleuze and Guattari. It provides a way to analyze and critique the structures of power and control that pervade society. By understanding entities as assemblages, one can begin to see how these structures are not monolithic or inevitable, but are composed of numerous interconnected elements that can be rearranged, resisted, or reimagined. This perspective opens up possibilities for change and transformation, emphasizing the potential for reassembling the components of society in more equitable, liberatory ways. In the broader scope of their work, assemblage ties into their other key concepts like rhizomes, lines of flight, and bodies without organs. It's part of their overarching vision of the world as a complex, interconnected web of relations and processes. Assemblages are not just things that exist in the world, they are the world, in all its complexity and multiplicity. They are the way things come together, change and evolve, the way life is continuously made and remade. Understanding assemblages is crucial for navigating the complexities of modern life. It's a way of thinking that recognizes the diversity and fluidity of the world, that sees potential in the connections and arrangements that constitute reality. By embracing the concept of assemblage, one can begin to approach life more creatively and flexibly, to engage with the world in its full complexity, and to participate in the ongoing process of creation and transformation that defines our existence. Plateau In a thousand plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari introduce the concept of a plateau as a means to structure their work and convey their non-linear, non-hierarchical approach to philosophy and scholarship. A plateau is a region of intensity, a level of continuous, self-vibrating region of intensities whose development avoids any orientation toward a culmination point or external end. This concept is borrowed from Gregory Bateson's work on Balinese culture, where he describes a plateau as a continuous purposeless state of intensity found in Balinese culture, extending beyond Western narrative structures that drive towards climax and resolution. For Deleuze and Guattari, a plateau is a way of engaging with topics, ideas, or problems, not in a linear or progressive manner, but as a series of intensive states. Each plateau can be read in any order. They are not stepping stones toward a conclusive end, but are instead meant to stand on their own, each offering a space for the exploration of various concepts and connections. This format reflects their rhizomatic approach to knowledge and their rejection of hierarchical structures in favor of a more open, non-linear mode of thought and existence. Each plateau is an assemblage in itself, a collection of interconnected ideas, images, stories and concepts that resonate with each other. The plateaus in a thousand plateaus cover a diverse range of topics, from linguistics and psychology to politics and anthropology. Yet, despite this diversity, they are all interconnected, each one feeding into and resonating with the others in unpredictable ways. This reflects the interconnected multiplicitous nature of the world as Deleuze and Guattari see it, not as a collection of isolated subjects or linear narratives, but as a complex intertwined web of relations and intensities. The concept of the plateau challenges traditional ways of thinking about beginning, middle and end, about progress, climax and resolution. It suggests that life, thought, and existence are not about reaching a final state or conclusion, but about inhabiting and moving through different intensities and experiences. Each plateau is a moment of becoming, a space of potential that exists not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. This approach has profound implications for how we understand and engage with the world. It encourages a more open, experimental attitude toward life and thought, one that values the journey as much as, if not more than, the destination. It suggests that the most important aspects of life are the intensities we experience, the connections we make, and the movements we go through, rather than the final states we achieve. In essence, the concept of the plateau embodies Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical project. It reflects their commitment to a philosophy of difference, multiplicity, and becoming. By embracing the plateau, one can begin to see the world not as a linear narrative to be followed, but as a rich, vibrant landscape of intensities to be explored and experienced. It's a way of thinking and being that opens up new possibilities for creativity, understanding and existence, 
allowing for a more nuanced, vibrant engagement with the world in its myriad wonders and mysteries. Stratification Stratification is a critical concept in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical discourse, notably featured in their Capitalism and Schizophrenia corpus. It refers to the way in which various forces or processes layer, segment, or organize reality into distinct strata. These layers can pertain to geological formations, biological life, social structures, linguistic developments, or psychic formations. In the deluso guattarian framework, stratification is a process that both enables and restricts the flow of matter, energy, and desire, shaping the organization of life and society. Stratification serves as a mechanism of organization and control, segmenting the chaotic and fluid flows of the world into ordered systems. For example, in the social realm, stratification occurs through the formation of classes, castes, or other hierarchical structures that define and delimit individuals' roles, behaviors, and interactions. In the realm of biology, organisms are stratified into species, genotypes, and phenotypes, each layer imposing certain constraints and possibilities on the form and function of life. However, Deleuze and Guattari view stratification with a critical eye. They argue that while some degree of organization is necessary for meaning and survival, excessive stratification can be stifling, limiting the potential for change, growth, and freedom. Overly rigid strata can prevent the free flow of desire and energy, leading to stagnation and repression. Therefore, a significant part of their philosophical project involves exploring ways to destabilize, disrupt, or escape these stratifications to enable more creative, liberated forms of existence. One of the key aspects of stratification they discuss is its dual nature. On one hand, strata are necessary for any production or expression. They give form and stability, allowing systems to function and entities to emerge. On the other hand, they are also sites of imprisonment, restricting the movement and potential of what they organize. This dual nature reflects the ambivalent relationship between order and chaos, stability and fluidity, control and freedom, that runs throughout Deleuze and Guattari's work. Stratification is also closely related to their concepts of territorialization, deterritorialization, and re-territorialization. Territorialization refers to the process of layering, segmenting, or codifying the flow of matter and desire into discrete territories or identities. Deterritorialization is the movement away from these territories, the dissolution or escape from stratified layers. Reterritorialization is the formation of new territories or strata, often as a response to or result of deterritorialization. Together, these processes describe the dynamic interplay between the forces of structure and change, order and disorder, that characterize all aspects of life. In understanding and critiquing stratification, Deleuze and Guattari provide a framework for analyzing and resisting the repressive structures that define and delimit individual and collective existence. They advocate for a continuous process of destratification, a loosening or opening up of rigid layers to allow for new connections, possibilities, and lines of flight. This is not to say that all structure should be abandoned, but rather that it should be engaged with critically and creatively, always aware of its potential to both enable and constrain. Stratification, then, is a key concept in navigating the complexities of existence. It provides a lens through which to understand the organization of the world and our place within it, as well as a pathway for imagining and enacting more liberated, vibrant forms of life. By grappling with the forces of stratification, we can begin to see the cracks and fissures in the seemingly solid structures that surround us, and through these openings, we can glimpse the potential for change, growth, and transformation. Imminence Imminence is a philosophical and theological concept that Deleuze reinvigorates and reinterprets in his work, including in Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Imminence, in its most general sense, refers to the idea that the divine, spiritual, or metaphysical is present and contained within the material world and does not transcend it. In Deleuze's philosophy, this concept is radicalized and secularized, turning into a fundamental principle that underpins his critique of traditional metaphysics, 
his understanding of life, and his vision for a new way of thinking and being. For Deleuze, immanence is not about the divine or a supreme being dwelling within the world. Instead, it's about the self-containing, self-generating, and self-organizing nature of reality. Everything that exists is a result of the interactions and connections within the plane of immanence. There is no external force, principle, or entity imposing order or meaning onto the world. Meaning, order, and being all emerge from the processes and relations that constitute the plane of immanence. This perspective marks a significant departure from traditional hierarchical or transcendental thinking, where the world is seen as created or governed by an external, superior entity or principle. Instead, Deleuze's concept of immanence affirms the inherent creativity, vitality, and value of the material world and the life within it. It's a flat ontology where everything is on the same level of existence and where the potential for creation and transformation is imminent to the world itself. In the context of capitalism and schizophrenia, immanence becomes a crucial counterpoint to the transcendent structures of control and signification that characterize capitalist society. Capitalism, with its imposition of market logic, hierarchical structures, and binary oppositions, can be seen as a transcendent system that overlays its order onto the imminent flows of desire, life, and matter. Deleuze and Guattari's project, then, is to release these flows from the transcendent structures that capture and codify them, to return to a plane of imminence where new forms of life and thought can emerge. Moreover, the principle of imminence is vital to their method of schizoanalysis, which seeks to understand the psyche, not as a theater of internal dramas shaped by external forces, such as the Oedipal narrative, but as a productive, self-organizing network of desires and processes. By focusing on the imminence of desire and experience, they aim to liberate the analysis of the psyche from the repressive models of traditional psychoanalysis and to open up new possibilities for understanding and transformation. Deleuze's imminence is a philosophy of radical imminence, one that insists on the creativity, potential, and value inherent in the material world. It's a call to recognize and engage with the world as a rich, dynamic field of possibilities, to see life and thought as processes of continuous becoming that unfold within the plane of imminence. This approach offers a powerful alternative to transcendent, hierarchical, and binary ways of thinking, inviting us to envision and enact a more open, fluid, and vibrant way of living. Imminence in Deleuze's philosophy is not just a concept but a way of relating to the world, a stance of openness, curiosity, and affirmation that recognizes the inherent worth and potential of all that exists. Micropolitics Micropolitics is a significant concept within Deleuze and Guattari's Capitalism and Schizophrenia, particularly as a response and extension to traditional political analysis. Traditional politics often focuses on large-scale structures and processes, such as states, economies, and global systems. In contrast, micropolitics looks at the more subtle, smaller-scale forces and interactions that influence individual and collective behavior, identity formation, and social change. It involves a focus on the minute, everyday practices and conditions that affect and constitute people's lives. Micropolitics recognizes that power is not only situated in institutions and grand narratives, but is also woven into the fabric of everyday life, affecting how individuals perceive themselves, interact with others, and engage with the world. This includes an array of diverse and often overlooked sites of power, such as family dynamics, language use, gender roles, and cultural practices. Micropolitical analysis seeks to uncover how these various domains shape and are shaped by broader social, economic, and political forces. For Deleuze and Guattari, micropolitics is deeply intertwined with their concepts of desire, assemblage, and deterritorialization. They argue that desire is a potent force for social organization and change, playing out in the micro-interactions and arrangements of everyday life. Desire does not just refer to individual wants or needs, but is a complex network of attractions, repulsions, and affiliations that shapes the way people relate to each other and the world. Micropolitics involves tracing these flows of desire, understanding how they are organized, coded, and sometimes overcoded, 
by various structures of power. The micropolitical approach also extends to the way individuals and groups resist, subvert, or transform these structures. Deleuze and Guattari are particularly interested in the potential for lines of flight, moments or movements that escape or deterritorialize the dominant codes and territories of power. Micropolitics involves not only analyzing how power operates on a small scale, but also identifying and fostering the potential for resistance and innovation within these operations. In their analysis, Deleuze and Guattari emphasize the importance of assemblages, which are complex constellations of relationships, objects, bodies, and concepts. Micropolitical power works through and within these assemblages, continuously shaping and being shaped by them. By focusing on assemblages, micropolitics can reveal the multifaceted, interconnected nature of power and resistance, showing how even the smallest shifts or changes can have significant effects. In sum, micropolitics is an essential aspect of Deleuze and Guattari's broader philosophical and political project. It provides a lens through which to examine the nuanced, everyday workings of power and desire, offering insights into the possibilities for change and transformation at the most intimate levels of society. By focusing on the micro, Deleuze and Guattari expand the scope of political analysis and action, showing that the potential for creativity, resistance, and revolution is present in every interaction, relationship, and moment of life. Micropolitics invites us to pay closer attention to the subtle dynamics of power that shape our world, encouraging us to engage with and influence these dynamics in pursuit of more liberated, vibrant forms of existence. Molar versus Molecular In Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Deleuze and Guattari introduce the distinction between the molar and the molecular as a way to analyze structures and movements within society, psychology, and politics. This distinction is crucial to understanding their approach to identity, organization, and change. The molar refers to large-scale, macro-level structures and formations. These are the visible, stable, and often rigid segments and positions within a society or an individual's identity. Molar entities are typically associated with social institutions, established norms, and collective identities. They are the large segments that make up the visible social strata, such as classes, genders, and races, characterized by their apparent stability and homogeneity. In the molar perspective, entities are categorized, labeled, and organized into distinct, clearly defined groups or roles. This perspective tends to emphasize generalizations, statistical norms, and social roles, leading to broad classifications and binary oppositions. It's the level of social organization where the law, traditional family structures, and long-standing cultural narratives operate. Molar structures are necessary for the functioning of society, providing stability and order, but they can also become sites of repression and control, enforcing conformity and suppressing difference. The molecular, on the other hand, refers to the small-scale, micro-level forces and interactions. These are the more fluid, dynamic, and subversive movements within and between the larger molar structures. Molecular processes involve subtle shifts, minor variations, and transient identities that escape or undermine the rigid classifications of the molar level. They represent the minute but potent forces of change, creativity, and resistance within the larger system. In contrast to the homogeneity of the molar, the molecular is characterized by heterogeneity, multiplicity, and constant becoming. It's the realm of difference, where identities are not fixed but continually negotiated and transformed. Molecular movements are the small, everyday acts of resistance, the subtle shifts in behavior and thought that can gradually lead to significant changes. They are the deviations from the norm, the minor fluctuations that can destabilize and reconfigure the larger structures. For Deleuze and Guattari, the interplay between the molar and the molecular is crucial to understanding social dynamics and personal identity. The molar and the molecular are not separate realms, but are intertwined and interdependent. Molar structures are continually traversed and potentially transformed by molecular movements, just as molecular processes are always taking place within and against the backdrop of molar formations. 
This interplay is particularly evident in processes of social change and personal development. Large-scale revolutions and reforms, molar changes, are often driven by or result in numerous small-scale alterations in attitudes, behaviors, and relationships, molecular changes. Similarly, personal growth and identity formation involve an ongoing negotiation between the societal roles and norms we inhabit, molar, and our individual desires, experiences, and deviations from these norms, molecular. The distinction between molar and molecular allows Deleuze and Guattari to analyze and critique the complexities of power, identity and change. It provides a nuanced approach that recognizes the importance of both stability and fluidity, order and chaos, control and resistance. By understanding the dynamic interplay between molar and molecular, we can better understand the forces that shape our world and ourselves, and we can engage more effectively in the processes of change and becoming that define our existence. This conceptual framework encourages a more flexible, open-ended approach to social analysis and personal identity, one that values diversity, multiplicity, and the potential for transformation at every level of existence. Multiplicity Multiplicity is a central concept in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy, particularly in capitalism and schizophrenia. It represents a fundamental challenge to traditional notions of unity, identity, and stability. Instead of viewing entities as singular, stable, and homogeneous, multiplicity suggests that entities are composed of many different heterogeneous elements and that they exist in a state of constant change and diversity. Multiplicity is not merely about having many parts, it's about the qualitative diversity and dynamic arrangements of those parts. It's a shift from thinking about things as coherent, unified wholes, to thinking about them as assemblages or networks of varied and fluctuating components. This approach reflects the real complexity of the world, where entities are not isolated or static, but are continuously interacting with and influencing each other in myriad ways. In the context of Deleuze and Guattari's work, multiplicity applies to all aspects of existence, biological, psychological, social, cultural, and more. For instance, an individual's identity is a multiplicity. It's not a single unified self, but a complex assemblage of thoughts, experiences, relationships, and biological components. Similarly, a society is a multiplicity of voices, perspectives, institutions, and cultural practices. Even concepts and ideas are multiplicities composed of a variety of meanings, interpretations, and applications. Multiplicity also has a vital, political dimension. It resists the reductive and oppressive tendencies of systems that seek to categorize, control, and homogenize. By emphasizing diversity, fluidity, and constant becoming, multiplicity affirms the potential for novelty, creativity, and resistance. It suggests that change is not only possible, but is an inherent aspect of existence, as new connections, arrangements, and lines of flight continuously emerge within and between multiplicities. Moreover, multiplicity is deeply intertwined with Deleuze and Guattari's other key concepts, such as the rhizome, deterritorialization, and the body without organs. Like a rhizome, a multiplicity is non-hierarchical and open-ended, capable of forming connections in multiple directions. The process of deterritorialization, where entities are freed from rigid structures and categories, leads to the creation of new multiplicities. The body without organs, as a plane of imminence and possibility, is the ultimate expression of multiplicity, a space where numerous flows and intensities intersect and interact. The concept of multiplicity encourages a more dynamic and inclusive approach to understanding the world. It challenges us to move beyond binary thinking and static categories, to embrace the complex, interconnected nature of life. By recognizing the inherent multiplicity of things, we can become more open to difference, more adaptable to change, and more creative in our thinking and living. Multiplicity is not just a philosophical concept, it's a way of perceiving and engaging with reality that emphasizes the richness, diversity, and endless potential of existence. It invites us to see the world not as a collection of isolated fixed entities, but as a vibrant, ever-changing tapestry of possibilities, 
where everything is interconnected and anything is possible. Smooth versus striated space. Deleuze and Guattari's distinction between smooth and striated space is an integral part of their philosophical exploration in capitalism and schizophrenia, particularly in A Thousand Plateaus. This distinction is used to describe different types of spaces and the behaviors, movements, and organizations they engender. It's a metaphorical contrast that has profound implications for understanding political, social, and personal dynamics. Smooth space is open ended continuous and unlimited in its potential for connection and movement. It's characterized by fluidity and flexibility. In smooth space, movement is free-form and nomadic, not confined by strict paths or boundaries. This type of space is akin to the sea or the desert, vast, open areas where travelers move without fixed roads, creating their paths as they go. Smooth space is not empty or anarchic. It has its own organization. But this organization is flexible, adaptive, and responsive to the needs and movements of those within it. In a smooth space, entities are free to interact, connect, and disperse in a fluid, non-linear fashion. This space encourages experimentation, innovation, and the kind of nomadic existence that Deleuze and Guattari admire. It's a space of becoming, where identities, relationships, and structures are continually created and recreated in response to changing conditions and connections. Striated space, on the other hand, is defined, bounded, and structured. It's the space of the city, the state, and the structured society, where movement is constrained by roads, walls, and regulations. Striated space is organized by fixed coordinates, grids, and territories. It's the kind of space that's familiar in most contemporary, urbanized societies, marked by clear separations, boundaries, and hierarchical arrangements. In striated space, movements are restricted and predictable, following the established paths, patterns, and rules. This space is about stability, predictability, and control. It's the realm of the sedentary, the centralized, and the regulated. While providing organization and coherence, striated space can also be limiting and repressive, constraining the free flow of desire, movement, and creativity. Deleuze and Guattari argue that no space is purely smooth or purely striated, rather these are ideal types that coexist and intermingle in complex ways. Every space contains elements of both smoothness and striation, and there are continual movements and shifts between the two. For instance a city, a predominantly striated space might have parks, markets, or festivals that function as smooth spaces within it. Conversely, a desert, a predominantly smooth space, might have paths, oases, or nomadic encampments that introduce elements of striation. The interplay between smooth and striated space has profound implications for understanding and navigating social, political, and personal life. It affects how we think about freedom, control, creativity, and resistance. Smooth spaces offer the potential for new connections, movements, and ways of living, while striated spaces provide organization, stability, and coherence. Both types of space are necessary, but the challenge is to find the right balance to prevent the overcoating and rigidity of striated spaces from stifling the creative, liberatory potential of smooth spaces. In capitalism and schizophrenia, smooth and striated space becomes a lens through which to analyze various phenomena, from art and music to urban planning and political organization. It's a way of thinking about how environments shape and are shaped by the behaviors, thoughts, and desires of those who inhabit them. By understanding the dynamics of smooth and striated space, individuals and societies can work toward creating environments that are more responsive, adaptive, and liberatory, fostering a way of life that is both organized and free, stable, and innovative. Effective investment. Effective investment is a crucial concept in Deleuze and Guattari's Capitalism and Schizophrenia, particularly as it pertains to their analysis of desire and the ways in which individuals and groups engage with and are constituted by social, political, and economic structures. This concept refers to the emotional, psychological, and desire-driven engagement of individuals with various aspects of their lives, including ideas, objects, people, and systems. At its core, effective investment is about the flows of desire and the intensities of emotion that attach individuals to certain outcomes, entities, or processes. 
It's the emotional charge that motivates and sustains engagement, whether that's in the context of personal relationships, work, social movements, or consumer behavior. Effective investment is what gives significance and meaning to our actions and interactions. It's the driving force behind why we do what we do and care about what we care about. Deleuze and Guattari's discussion of effective investment is intimately linked to their broader theories of desire and assemblages. Desire in their framework is not lack or want for something absent, but a productive positive force that drives creation and connection. Effective investment is one of the ways this desire manifests, directing energies and creating attachments to various parts of the social and material world. In the context of capitalism, effective investment is particularly significant. Capitalism doesn't just exploit labor or resources, it also captures and directs desire. It channels effective investments towards certain goods, behaviors, or identities, shaping consumer culture and social relations. Brands, for instance, aren't just selling products, they're selling identities, lifestyles, and values. They're seeking to become the object of intense effective investment, drawing consumers into a relationship, not just with a product, but with a whole assemblage of meanings and associations. However, effective investment isn't just a tool of control, it's also a potential site of resistance and transformation. Because effective investments are deeply tied to how individuals and groups understand and engage with the world, shifting these investments can lead to significant changes in behavior, belief, and social organization. Social movements, for example, often work by reorienting effective investments, drawing attention and emotional energy away from dominant narratives and towards alternative visions or critiques. Deleuze and Guattari's concept of effective investment thus provides a powerful lens for understanding the emotional and desire-driven dimensions of social life. It offers insight into how individuals and groups form attachments and identities, how systems of power engage and direct desire, and how changes in effective investment can lead to broader social and personal transformations. By examining the flows of desire and emotion that underpin our engagements with the world, we can gain a deeper understanding of the forces that shape our lives and the potentials for creating change. Effective investment is not just about what we think or do, but about what we feel and desire, making it a vital aspect of any analysis of human behavior and social systems. Schizophrenia as a Positive Process In Capitalism and Schizophrenia, particularly in Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Guattari reconceptualize schizophrenia, not as a clinical condition to be treated in the traditional psychiatric sense, but as a metaphorical process that embodies radical potential for creativity and liberation from the repressive structures of society and the psyche. Their approach is a radical departure from the negative connotations typically associated with the term, proposing instead that schizophrenia represents a process of deterritorialization and intense production of desire. In traditional psychiatric discourse, schizophrenia is characterized by a breakdown in the relation between thought, emotion, and behavior, leading to faulty perception, inappropriate actions or feelings, withdrawal from reality and personal relationships into fantasy and delusion, and a sense of mental fragmentation. However, Deleuze and Guattari argue that the schizophrenic experience can be understood differently, as a manifestation of the desire's flow that breaks free from the Oedipal structures imposed by psychoanalysis and the capitalist societal norms. The schizophrenic process, as they present it, is one of intense and constant production, a sort of nomadic journey through various intensities and experiences without the need for a unifying or stable identity. It's about experiencing life in a way that is not mediated by the pre-established symbolic orders and representations. This process involves a kind of radical openness to the multiplicities of existence, a continual becoming that challenges the rigid, binary, and stratified structures of society. Deleuze and Guattari's interpretation of schizophrenia is metaphorical using it to describe a broader philosophical stance or process rather than the specific clinical condition. They see the schizophrenic process as embodying the ultimate line of flight, an escape from the overcoding and repressive regimes of capitalism and social order. 
In this sense, schizophrenia represents not a state to be feared or cured, but a potential to be embraced, a radical way of engaging with the world that breaks down the artificial barriers between self and other, subject and object, reality and imagination. However, it's essential to note that Deleuze and Guattari do not romanticize the clinical condition of schizophrenia. They are fully aware of the suffering and challenges it entails. Instead, they are interested in the conceptual implications of the schizophrenic process, the way it challenges our understanding of normality, order, and organization. Their work suggests that by embracing a kind of schizophrenic thinking, we might open up new ways of understanding and interacting with the world, characterized by fluidity, creativity, and continual becoming. In conclusion, for Deleuze and Guattari, schizophrenia as a positive process is about the potential for radical deterritorialization and re-territorialization, for breaking free from the dominant narratives and structures that constrain human thought and action. It's an invitation to think differently about desire, identity, and society, and to embrace the chaotic, generative potential that lies at the heart of existence. This perspective offers a powerful critique of the status quo and a hopeful vision for new forms of life and thought.